This episode is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Launching nearly 20 years ago, this ASX-listed company is ranked number one for overall platform functionality and user satisfaction by investment trends for the past three years. As the financial advice landscape changes, it's important now more than ever to embrace new technology and enhance the way you do business. With this change comes your chance to innovate, explore new perspectives, and realize new efficiencies. NetWealth is here to support you on this journey by providing you market-leading technology, excellent customer support, and expertise to help you innovate in your business. Visit the NetWealth website to learn more and get the PDS which clients should read before making a decision. Products issued by NetWealth Investments Limited. So Claire Weivel Platter, thank you so much for coming along to the XY Advisor podcast. You're welcome. Uh, for those that don't know Claire, but um, I, I, I find that kind of hard to believe, <laughs> um, Claire's the, the chairman of, of the Fold Legal, uh, and I uh, wouldn't hesitate in saying that Claire was very generous with XY Advisor and spending a bit of time with us when we were first kind of in our embryonic state and kind of muddling our way through, you know, learning to to crawl, I guess. <laughs> well, I loved what you guys are trying to achieve. So it was a, a, a great pleasure, you know, to be involved in the gestation of that. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Really, really appreciate and it. So You're... far, so good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we're still here. We haven't stepped on ourselves. <laughs> so it's, it's good. Good legal advice. <laughs> <laughs> so what's, what's been, uh, what's been kind of keeping, keeping you guys busy at the moment? What are we guys kind of focused yeah. on and, and all that sort of stuff? Well, um, I think for me personally, um, or for the fold generally, there's been two key, uh, the, the most work we're doing in the financial advice space is regulatory kind of disciplinary work of various forms, um, FPA, ASIC, and of course the Royal Commission. And uh, personally, my my practice where, where we're seeing a lot of interest at the moment is around this issue of vertical integration. What mm. does that mean? Uh, for advisors who um, are running MDA services or internal SMAs or even mm -hmm. badged platforms or any sort of badged uh, investment advisory service, mm -hmm. what's what are the issues that they're facing based on this increased scrutiny uh, coming from the regulator and, of course, from the Royal Commission? Uh, so we've been doing a lot of work on that. So so with the alignment, I, I always find it quite interesting because you look at, um, obviously, there's the classic look at the um, institutional alignment, but then some of the smaller scale stuff where traditionally, like you've got closer alignment between the investment management and is that coming into play now? Well, it inevitably has to be looked at, yeah. right? Because so it's just a blanket. If they make a call overall, that they, even though they're targeting the larger institutions, it can fall down and affect the smaller yeah, players. Yeah, exactly. So when you listen to the Royal Commission and they're talking about vertical integration, you know, there's two levels on which they're talking about it. So one level is you've got the bank on the one hand and the funds management, wealth management business on the other, right? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of easy. And if they if that's what they regard as vertical integration mm. and that's what they're going to stop. And, and just to clarify that, that's the bank being the manufacturer of a product. The bank being like deposit takers and lenders, yep. if you like. Yeah. yeah, and then having a distribution service below that being the, the wealth management yeah. um, in kind of quotation. With so, the in-house funds management, if you like, yeah, or co-owned yeah. funds So that's, that's that definition of vertical integration, yeah. which I think most people kind of get, but mm. then the... That's the, the traditional level. vertical yeah. alignment yeah. sort of... Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, the, the reality is, if you think about it, I mean, yeah, sure, if you walk into a bank branch and you're, you're expecting to deposit some money or talk about a loan and somebody is offering you, you know, uh, financial advice, and then they give you bank products. Yeah, I, you know, I, I or bank products owned by the same group. You know, I see that that's obviously an issue with vertical integration, depending on what they purport, what sort of advice they purport to be giving you. Mm. Right. So yeah, sure, but. Whoever said cross-selling was a bad thing? I mean, cross-selling is a fine thing. So it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a problem. The problem only arises if people do the wrong thing, right? And so we've looked at, ASIC issued a report and they've talked about the fact that in these, um, you know, vertically integrated businesses, mm. something like 84% of uh, clients are given an internal product. Well, they're, they're really high numbers. The question is, is that transparent, right? Is is the client going there with the expectation that they'll mm. be put into products? Are they are the advisors who are giving them that advice, you know, adequately looking at other products? Are mm. they selling them products that are less than standard or you know not as good for them as other products well, yeah, what's might the be? Benchmark and... Yeah, and not being clear about the fact that they that they are going to be putting them into bank products or the mm -hmm. products owned by that group. I think that's the issue. My, yeah. Personally, that's the issue, and that is not actually a vertical integration issue. It's a conflicts of interest <laughs> issue, mm. right? Yeah. And how, so you've got to ask yourself, well, why? What would be 
required to appropriately manage that conflict of interest and is that happening? Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I think it's been pretty clear, um, you know, ASIC's made it pretty clear from some of the reports they've done, that remuneration structures Mm -hmm. and I guess, you know, management directives, if you like, are what's really important there. Yeah. What influences a lot of that activity? Well, yeah, because if you're if you're being influenced uh, by um, a remuneration structure to promote internal product as opposed to have a wide suite of products or even just by the fact that you know you're you're owned by a certain organization and they have certain expectations of you mm. and it may be for example that you know that there are support levels that they provide depending <laughs> on how how um, loyal you are or you know other interesting words that 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 might get sure. used right <laughs> so they're really they're really difficult issues and and the reality is that if that is happening that is going to be a breach of the client priority rule yeah so the I'm curious to know, like, just because it's always hard from everyone looks at advice and going, okay, turning it into a profession. How do they, how do you, like, because I'm sure in the legal world, you're technically allowed to have an aligned product that. Um, that you can actually end up recommending. What's how do you guys deal with it? Like, yeah, because that's a sort of similar analogy, isn't yeah, it? In yeah, terms of- yeah. Well, we, we most lawyers don't have products. Actually, we're kind of unusual in that respect. But jeez, you guys need some business coaches. <laughs> 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 well, we we have products. I reckon they were- the Claire Weevil package. <laughs> <laughs> we we have products which are like manuals and tools and templates and agreements yeah. and so forth that people can use. And of course, we will recommend our clients use them. I and mean, we stand by those. Mm. So if you come to us and you ask us for advice, the reality is we could charge you a bundle of money to mm. do everything from scratch. Or we could say, look, you can go and get this template off our website mm. and that's going to be cheaper for you. And if it needs some customization, we can do it. But we make no bones about that. We're very clear mm. about yeah. what we do. And this it's all is, very service oriented as well. Yeah, yeah. As opposed to being. Well, hang on. Just just in terms of the product, I'm kind of keen to spend a little bit of time on that. So, you know, especially if you are an SME that that has a, a vertical integration, which which of course kind of has its inherent conflicts in it. I think that I think that conversation still makes sense. So, hang on. I've I've built something that that I believe in and that I think is, you know, the the way in which I can best serve my clients. And so long as I'm clear that that exists and that that fits only a certain amount of people and that people need to be clear about whether or not they they fit into that service that it doesn't make sense for me to reinvent the wheel just to avoid a vertical integration setup i completely agree and you've hit the nail on the head um one of the interesting so this that what i'm ta- talking to clients about is this it, that very thing about knowing who your clients are and what their needs are and if you have a solution which you have designed for your client base because you know you've attracted clients of a certain type that have certain certain needs and I'm not talking about a one size fits all but a commonality of needs that you you've kind of designed a solution for then mm. naturally you're going to have a preponderance of those clients and whatever solution you've designed is going to be suitable for a preponderance of those mm. clients. and it makes you sense t- makes sense to make it easier to deliver yep productize it so to yep. speak a scalable business, for efficiency right? yeah 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 so how do you manage that how do you manage then the actual conflict, potentially, let's say, because it happens to be some sort of product, right, that's yep. maybe an MDA or an SMA that you've yep. created, um, where you're definitely going to be offering an in-house product, how do you how do you manage that conflict and make sure that you're acting in the client's best interest? Well, my view about that is that you need to, number one, be very transparent about the fact that, you know, this is the sort of client you look after. Yep. This is the solution. This is your preferred solution for your clients that you have um, designed it and examined it and, you know, as objectively as possible and maybe even with some, you know, third-party assistance, yeah. said, yes, this is this solution is suitable for this type of client. And, you know, there's, it, there may be variations in that, right? So you might have sort of matrix of which parts of it are solution, suitable for which parts of your client base. And then you are very transparent about that with your client. So you say to them, look, you know, this is our preferred client, this is our sort of client base, this is our preferred solution, this is what we will offer you. The only time we will not offer it to you is if, in your circumstances, it's not suitable for you. And we will make an assessment of that, we'll explain that to you, we'll help work through that with you so that you're in a position where you can make an informed decision about this mm. solution mm. and we we will undertake not to recommend that to you if yeah. it's not suitable for you. That is actually our <clears throat> duty and our obligation, right? Be- do, you that- think, do you think we've struggled from a lack of of um, clear definition of what's appropriate and what's not? Well, 
I think that's a professional issue. Okay, mm. so mm. clear definition is you know what does that mean? Mm. Because you're not going to get a regulator to come out and say what appropriate means. Mm. I yeah. mean, what we know the test is is would a reasonable financial advisor in the similar circumstances, <laughs> right, with similar information, think that this product is likely to mean that the client will be better off. That's the test, mm -hmm. right? So if you can satisfy that test, and sometimes you might actually, that because it's an objective test, you might, it's a good idea to get some maybe investment professionals or other advisors in to kind of, um, you know, sense test your, your solution to make sure that it does stand up. Yeah. Well, that's actually what happens in the group quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. yeah. People yeah. are thinking of new ideas and like, what do you think, guys? Yeah. And they get Some, holes poked in it. Yeah. Something a lot of people don't know is, you know, this new um, product power that ASIC is, uh, is is proposing or the Treasury are proposing to give ASIC where ASIC has the ability to um, suspend products if they think they're not um, suitable for, you know, or appropriate. Is that along the lines of the conversation of consoli forcing consolidation in industry funds? No, as well? no, no, oh, no. This no. is okay. no. This is a new product power that ASIC's okay. been asking for for a while, and that is currently in a bill before Parliament. Mm. Um, and basically. It's to avoid the sorts of dodgy products we've seen in the past uh, where they've been inappropriately rated, say, or, or even inappropriately structured, or they're being inappropriately offered um, mm -hmm. to the wrong types of people. Mm -hmm. Because like, APRA, like, like West Point, remember those structured mm. venture products that yeah, West Point, yeah, right? So, so you know, they're products that probably should never have been offered to retail investors. So, And a lot of the agri products. Mm. Right? So, so APRA, just to go back yeah. to APRA, does that... Not That's, APRA. This is ASIC. I oh, know, I know. Yeah. But the the way they get into the industry and available is through APRA first, isn't it? No. Oh, they don't get approved by APRA at all? No. Okay. No, no, no. These are managed investment products. That okay. Are, so that no APRA involvement? Not it's like, just no. ASIC? Yeah, just ASIC. Okay. Yeah. So ASIC's mm. got, this, got this power now. If it sees a product it doesn't like, okay. um, it can suspend that product mm. for a period yep. and enter into a negotiation, if you like, with the product provider. Right. right? right. So that, that bills before Parliament at the moment. What a lot of people don't know is that there's a second part to that proposed reform. And that second part is something called a – it's a requirement to do something called a target market determination. Yeah, I know. It's you know, like you know they love these <laughs> these expressions, but what's a target? Not market a TMD. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it will become a TMD for sure. Three letter acronyms. Yeah, that's right. Anyway, a TMD will be, and and both product providers and advisors are going to be required to TMD, um, and what that will require is for an advisor to, and I'm, I'm not worried about product providers, I'm talking about your audience at the moment, for advisors to actually work out um, for the products that they recommend what the target market for that product is. Interesting. Right? Okay. So is that any different to what I've just been talking about, the client, what I call a client suitability policy, mm. right? It's really a target market. Really have that in mind when you're yeah. coming out. But yeah. so, rather the onus is on the product. Pro or the, is it service providers as well? It's both. both. Okay, it's both. Yeah. So the product provider will be required to do the target market determination. Yeah. So in its product documentation, it will actually be required to say, this is for whom we think this product is suitable, right? Mm -hmm. And then the advisor needs to f form their own view as right. well. So let's say an advisor puts together and with a, you know, with a responsible entity in SMA or they're running an MDA because yep. an MDA is a product, they will actually have to do this TMD, target market determination, or as I call it, <laughs> suitability analysis, yeah. right, which kind of is a little bit, you know, makes more sense. Yeah. And so if that bill goes through, that's going to be law anyway. And, mm. and I guess my view about this is, well, kind of I thought of that first. Well, I didn't obviously <laughs> actually know. Treasury are ahead of us. And right. if you think about it, that's what an advisor should be doing. Yep. You know, for whom, if I'm going to have a, a, an in-house solution or a sort of a, a packaged solution, if yep. you like, I've got to not be offering that to people for whom it's not suitable. Mm. And in order to do that, I've actually got to be kind of pretty clear about mm. for whom is it suitable, what are the criteria of yep. those people, and then be able to demonstrate on each occasion that that I've analysed that client suitability for that relative product. to the relative the to the TMD criteria. of that service. Exactly. <laughs> well, this is yeah. It's interesting in terms of when you look at the breadth of products out there. Like it's impractical for everyone to be an expert in all these products that are there. So, well, one of the things that totally amazed me years ago when I first saw my first saw my first approved product list was that it it just was a list of products, and I said to them, "Don't you give your advisors any?" indication of for whom these products are suitable mm. and in what circumstances you could use, should mm. use them. They said, no, 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 that's up to them. Mm. And it's like, but 
seems to me pretty risky mm-hmm. if that's what you're doing. So effectively what this TMD requirement will end up being is a kind of a, a much more intelligent product approved product list, mm. I think. There is a bushfire scale on them, though, to tell you how much risk is in them. Is there? <laughs> yeah, but that's just risk, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, no, I'm being facetious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, there's, there's yeah no, 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 I've seen that, right? Yeah. But, but, but at the end of the day, high-growth products are great for some people, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, not products that have got too much risk, I guess, that they're going to blow up. But high-growth products are terrific. There's, a, for, there, for, there's an element of people that that have an appetite for that. That's right. Yeah, oh, because yeah. I'm one of them, so. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the the point I like around that, I, I know obviously you're looking at the risk aspect because yeah. um, that's what you guys do, but yeah. I'm looking at it going, well, that's just going to make it easier, like more efficient I for guys so. to do the job. Because like so. some of the biggest wastage of advisor time is assessing products unnecessary, like or having to go through the recreate the flow yeah. every time there and it's not adding any value to a client like if they just need to understand that quicker and it can be done then why not yeah create yeah. that i think i think one of the things that i in in my experience was was kind of intrigued by is that I and I, I love the idea that a, a, a client's going to be the center of an advice like that. That just has to happen. But clearly, I have views and beliefs about how things could best be done in financial services. And an individual, an individual would come to me to seek that that kind of expertise. Mm. But then I'm kind of in an awkward situation where I where I have I have what I what I think is trialed and tested and I've got the, my way of doing things mm. but I can't talk about any of that that's behind the door over there I have to sit down with a client with a clean slate and then and then see whether or not their story is weaved into something that sits sits behind me mm. but I think part of what you're kind of talking about now Claire is it's absolutely appropriate for advisors to have a banner out the front on the website, whatever it is, to say these are the people that we serve and these these are the reasons why and this is how we do it. Yeah. Mm. Well, this is the solution we offer, right? Mm. Yeah. This is the solution we offer. And, you know, so people actually, they can select you. I don't think it has to be behind the scenes. I yeah. think it should. You, 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 We are all specialists, right? Yeah. You know. But then you're flogging product. See, no, 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 not at all. Not not necessarily. You okay. can say, you know, this this is the service we offer and it's suitable for the these types of clients, mm. yeah, if you like, you yeah. know, these are this, these are the clients that we serve best. So, you know, the folded, for example, is mm-hmm. really clear about that. We do not act for major institutions. Our favourite clients are um, small to medium enterprises, you know, that are um, entrepreneurial, particularly, mm-hmm. and of course, we love startups as well because, like, <laughs> we're very busy in that area. Um, and and we like servicing those clients because we like to we like to deal with people who are creative, who are decision makers. You know, where where we're working with those who, for every piece of advice we give, is meaningful. Uh, you know, you're not working in a sort of a faceless, nameless organisation. So mm. we're really clear about that. We don't invite business from large institutions, and and we don't we don't chase that business. And even on our website, that's clear. So you can. You can be the same as an advisor. Yeah, you can say, you know, we. This is mm. who we look after. It's a lot of firms look after high net worth. I've got one client who's got a real focus, for example, on lower balance clients because they mm-hmm. think they're underserved and they think there's opportunities there. Yeah. So there's no reason why you can't say that yeah. that's who we look for. And of course, you don't have to say, well, we're going to flog you our product. But you can say, we've. You can say things like, well, we've got. Uh, we we believe our approach is you know yeah. really suitable you know for for that and and we'll tell you we look forward to telling you all about it. and then when they come in you're really clear you know that yeah. that you've got a really efficient way of of managing their affairs and looking after them and and that unless it's not suitable for them that's what you'll recommend you can even go one step further so you could say you could say for example uh, we'll only look after clients like that so our solution may not be suitable for you and we'll assess yeah. that with you when you first come in to make yeah. sure we're a fit and if it's not then you know we may have to refer you to somebody else who's more suitable for you yeah. that's yeah. fine too yeah the the big risk is you know that you don't want to turn a client away so then what do you do mm. and then you've got that problem yes well, it's yeah. always the challenge well, and that, and this is you know i we at, at at the business that i work for we've got a an nda service that we we're very sort of proud about but we're, we're we are upfront about about the fact that this this is a, a solution who's that is suitable for a, for a certain amount of people and we'll assess that with you but i think i think to be able to stand up comfortably and say say that you kind of do need to have that audit trail of people who have come in to see you that don't fit and you said i'm sorry mm. Mm. like you kind of need that right i think i think so not so much that don't fit i think the audit trail you need is 
um, your suitability policy, if you like, mm, that okay. is, all right, for whom is it suitable? And then for each client, okay, let's assess that and demonstrate that you have. Yep. Right? And yes, there may be some that you turn away. It may be not because your marketing might be so targeted that you actually Good only point. get clients that, <laughs> that fit within your criteria, yeah, right? Yeah. So it's more the it's more being able to demonstrate that you did that assessment every time and that each client that you, you know, that you accepted or that you recommended your service to fitted within that criteria. And I think people tend to do that the other way around. They kind of try to fit the, the service to the client rather than the client to the service. Yeah. 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 Which, and, yeah, or in the end, you, you, that needs to happen, but whether that's how you run your business or mm. not, you might have to send it out to someone else. And that's the hard bit. That's yeah, like, yeah. But if you decide, for example, I, I definitely have clients who have an MDA service mm-hmm. that they offer to the people who really don't want day-to-day involvement in their investments. And then those that do, they offer them, a, you know, a more sort of um, a, a platform where, and, and they offer to call the client. But they generally have to charge the client a little extra for that because mm-hmm. that's less efficient than running an MDA service. Mm. Makes total sense, yeah. Mm. And then, you know, I, so that that model, I, and I, I can kind of empathise because I, I, I somewhat live that day to day, but would you see or what what, what perhaps are, are comments around that happening at, a, at an institutional level? Because, you know, that, that that's a vertically integrated model that could work absolutely in an SME and it's nice and tidy, but what about if, you've, if you're a broad church? Well, let's, let's, you just have to be really honest about what it is that you're doing. So, yeah. It used to be the case when you went to an AMP advisor, you're going to get an AMP product, and you knew that. Right? Yeah. So when did that change, and why did that change? The the concept of a platform came in, right? So uh, the platform was really a place to house, um, you know, to house product. And so was there a perception then? And I'm not I'm not singling out AMP by the way. I, I'm not, I use that word, but I'm not. But you know, once products came in, there was a percep- They came in so that people could. Um, it, it was a margin shift. The margin, all the margin, was sitting in the platform, yeah. right? And and they were you were able to access funds at wholesale rates. And so there was a perception, therefore, that that would enable in-house advisors to offer a broader range of products and give diversification and so mm-hmm. forth. And uh, but what we've seen, of course, is that that tends not to be happening. That you're still getting a preponderance of um, house products as well as like the house platform. Yeah. I guess um, different yeah. pricing preferentials, etc. Well, who, there's all sorts of reasons why, mm. but so so that promise is not being held out. So, but but the reality is, if you were, uh, you know, a, an owned uh, an advisor group where the the licensee was owned by one of those major institutions, my view is you just have to be transparent about what it is that you're doing, and if it is the fact that you're going to be offering, pre- you know, by preference, um, as a default, the in-house product, then that's what you've got to tell the client. Yeah. But they they still have the same duty. A, they've got to be transparent. B, yeah. they still have to make sure that those products are appropriate for the client and that a reasonable advisor in that situation would consider that the client is likely to be better off as a result of having those products. I'm just I'm just thinking uh, it would have been interesting having uh, Ben Nash in uh, this session. He, he did a great podcast with uh, Phil Kewitt and uh, Mark Bynum the other week. Oh, interesting. Mm. Having having a, a maybe a bit of a contrarian view to what you're uh, discussing here about the acceptability of that, he was. Well, I think it's just a change of the emphasis. I, I think what Claire's saying can can totally make sense so long as you you're, you're genuinely transparent about what you're building for. Um, and and one one of the things when you were sort of talking, Claire, I was, I was thinking about uh, comparing our environment to what what I see in sort of the United States. Uh, and the fact that there is vertically integrated models there, mm. but they just sit outside of a fiduciary obligation, which in my mind feels like it might make sense because that's somebody going to a broker dealer or a, or a stockbroker, um, but knowing but knowing that that stockbroker only has one product or one mm. service that it can offer. So the client's going in there fully informed and mm. fully aware that if I go to see Gary at uh, you know, Wells Fargo, then I'm mm. going to get a Wells Fargo yep. investment portfolio. Do they have different yeah. um, names, I guess, or label yeah, titles? Yeah. So you've, you've got you've, – well, it's kind of RIAs mm-hmm. or the Registered Investment Advisor yep. is, is the equivalent of an Australian financial advisor. So fiduciary obligation, best yep. interest and all that sort of thing. But they do have a, a service where there is no fiduciary obligation. And that sits with uh, some of the the, the the fund managers or the yeah. stockbrokers. Yeah. Would they still be called a financial advisor? Or? I I don't know. I don't know that the term financial advisor is regulated to the extent that it is here. Okay. Yeah, but it, it's kind of interesting when you when you look at what's going on in Australia at the moment, mm. and you kind of think about the model over there. I just wonder if there is a a place for people. I've got to be careful how I say this, but you know, people not or advisors or you know 
investment managers not necessarily taking into account the client's circumstances, but being very, very clear about that. And the reason why I wonder if there's an opportunity for something like that to exist is because if in-house products and, and you know everybody needs to take into account everyone's circumstances, inevitably the cost to serve it goes up. Mm. So people who want financial advice or are equipped to you know learn and, and educate themselves about financial decisions, they just need a little bit of help implementing it. Mm. They're unable to do that in the current scheme of things because if they it's go to expensive. talk to you, me, or anyone else, mm. we have to go through a whole process, um, which which might might be a, a you know a, a thick wrapper around what they're trying to achieve. Mm. I'm just kind of thick th- wrapper. Look, that that definitely a- exists now um, at the top end of the market where you've got professional investment advisors who deal directly with clients, um, and they say this is our in-house approach, and if you like it, put some money with us. Right? Mm. So at wholesale level, though, that so there's wholesale, that barrier, right? Yeah. It's, it, they tend to operate at wholesale level. So why is it different at retail level? The difference is, of course, because retail clients um, don't necessarily have the sophistication and knowledge to make those decisions. And so where there's an advice layer, that's where the conflict of interest comes in. So Mm. the advisor Mm. plays this really interesting role when they've got in-house product, right? So Mm. when they start out with the client, they've got this fiduciary duty and they cannot prefer their own interests to the interests of the client. They must... In, de- in determining whether their in-house product is suitable for the client, mm-hmm. they've absolutely got to, to, to put on the hat of a reasonable financial advisor in their circumstances, and that's the fiduciary duty. Mm-hmm. Once that determination has been made, and let's call it a TMD, right, or the application <laughs> yeah. of the target, because it's t- is, is this client in my target market, mm. um, once that determination is made, then they can go on and, you know, be, if you like, the product provider and simply deliver the service that they've determined is suitable for the client. Mm. So it's at that advice stage that the fiduciary duty is so critically important. Mm. And I think, you know, the problem is, as I see it, that traditionally advisors have been quite patriarchal, and I use that word advisedly, in the way that they, they deal with clients. They've traditionally felt that they've needed to almost make the client's decisions for them. Mm-hmm. And this is where I think we've we've come, we've had problems mm. um, because uh, there's not been that separation, if you like, of, well, yeah, I'm making the recommendation for the client and also ma- kind of making the decision for the client. Mm. So uh, when I've got a vested interest, you know, what does what am I doing to manage that? Mm. Okay, then there, there hasn't been enough done to manage those vested interests. And that starts with often with, you know, in the, in the the way that they're remunerated. Mm-hmm. And, and, of course, if you've got your own business, you know, obviously yeah. it's going to be more profitable for you if you're using an in-house product, well, potentially, and maybe you can structure it so that it's it's even-handed. Mm. But um, then, you know, the, the other issue is uh, um, what other expectations are being placed on them, you know, by mm. by others, by their whoever owns their business yep. Or, yep. or even in, you know, case of a smaller business, their employee, right? So you have to structure the way the advisor is mentored, remunerated and managed mm. so that they can genuinely, so that the the uh, objectivity of that recommendation mm. and, and an appropriateness of it is actually their core KPI, mm. right? And not... Not the re- and then the rest will follow. Well, the other mm-hmm. element around uh, that, I guess, what we're talking about is how much does the client understand what's going on? And like we, we had a classic case um, when I've been assessing, oh, do you want to use a net promoter score in assessing whether the client has had a good time with the advice? But having a good time and a good experience in in the advice flow doesn't necessarily mean it's been a good it's it's a good advice delivery, because a lot of clients will have a great they'll they'll get on really well with the advisor. Yeah. They'll come out and then you could ask them like next week what. What happened? And they'll have no idea what they talked about sometimes yeah. in terms of like why investments or insurances and what was included into that. Yeah. So, um, well, yeah, looking at that NPS score is actually looking at all different metrics and going, well, what's, it's probably important to find out how much they understood or how confident they are of their understanding mm-hmm. because then so- it – 
Yeah. At the end of the day, the only, the, literally the only test is, was the advice appropriate for that client? Mm. Mm. You know, reasonably, objectively appropriate. And one of the great things is, um, you probably know that I've been involved with a business called Red Marker that's de- had developed an amazing tool um, that looks at advisor websites and, and uses artificial intelligence to analyse advisor websites against all the rules for promotions, um, promoting financial services to see whether that those websites are uh, compliant or not. Wow. Yeah, I know it's really awesome. Awesome. Yeah, and they are now working on an SOA tool, uh-huh. and the SOA tool, the key thing, wow. is not just the compliance of the SOA. You know, did it contain all the required material? Because, like, you know, that's a bit of a tick box exercise. <coughs> what they're really, really working on is assessing the appropriateness of the advice, and if they nail that, and that is really hard. Yeah, yeah. Um, but and the early indications are excellent. You mm. know, the, they're in testing beta phase at the moment. Um, but if if and when they nail that, what will be so cool is that advisors will have a filter that they can run that awesome. run their advice through, yeah. right? Mm. Yeah. How good would that be? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. May I? I'll ask a, a kind of a devil's advocate question. Would you perhaps see a world where that AI gets to the point where it might make sense to take the advisor out of the equation. Well, that's looking at the problem the the other way, which is going is digital advice, right? Yeah. So yes, absolutely. AI could get so sophisticated that you can take an incredibly complex scenario with a client, and um, and you could you know apply the AI analysis to it and come up with a recommendation. But look. <sighs> At the, and, and we are moving towards that world. We've already got analytical te- tools in XPlan and they're pretty good. You know, there's, there's a whole bunch of tools that are moving in that direction. Mm. You just have to sort of input information. So, so it's, you know, what, it, what then becomes the role of the advisor? Mm. Well, we all know the role of the advisor is coach, um, guide, mentor, keeping the client on track, um, making the client comfortable with their mm. decisions to make mm. sure that the you know that the decisions they make are right uh, checking in with the client regularly to you know to, to make sure that that they remain comfortable mm. and and making sure that if anything changes things you know things do change so these tools of course will become available to advisors but they'll never take advisors out of the equation because yeah. somebody's got to, there, there'll be always be a proportion of clients who need um, you know need their hands held and to be honest with even though with those tools you still need to apply human judgment over the top mm, because mm. no matter how sophisticated AI becomes, you know, it's unlikely that it's ever going to be able to read body language, for example, um, you know, which is often something mm. uh, that, that, that you know, an advisor can pick up on or that yeah. just those those sorts of signs that you would work with a client regularly to, to understand with it, what their degree of comfort is with the strategies that you're recommending. On degrees, does that kind of imply, again, a loaded question, but... You know, it sounds like that that competency is is kind of a financially literate psychologist or yeah. a financially literate coach, um, and and the reason I, I'm kind of thinking about that in the context of you know we're going through a whole bunch of education reform at the moment, and I'll bang my drum about what I think we should be learning, which is all about psychology and managing the people and those sorts of things. But I'm kind of keen on, on maybe your thoughts around that stuff as well. Yeah, I think I think that there are a whole range of skills that advisors need that are not necessarily taught as part of the advice um, proce- advice education process. That's one of them, and another one is writing. Advisors <laughs> written word don't Who know how thought? to write. <laughs> yeah. They don't know how to express themselves and express their advice properly, and that is one of the things that leads to so many problems with mm. statements of advice. Because mm. you know the prevailing view at the regulator is if it's not in the statement of advice, it didn't happen. I mean, and if it's not in the statement of advice, you can't demonstrate or through a file note or something else yeah. that, um, you know, that something was done, then it didn't happen. That That's the rule. And people are being breached. Um, and indeed, we've had, um, we've seen instances of clients actually being banned, not for bad advice, but for bad record keeping. Now, mm. I'd, um, my view is that that's not appropriate, but it is happening. So advisors, what we know now is that these templated advice, ad, statements of advice are by and large dreadful. Yeah. The concept of having standard reasons for recommending <laughs> things um, really doesn't exist, uh, but it's still prevalent in the industry because advisors, um, even though statements of advice take a lot of time to craft, advisors haven't really been taught how to and don't have the, the tools at hand to to craft them so that they really speak to the client in language the client understands and are really personalised to the client. And that's a skill that advisors going forward are just have to develop. That's and awesome, I, yeah. 
and and adapting your language as well, right? So not being so binary, I suppose, with the way that you write. So talking to different people in different ways and mm. demonstrating that. It's kind of an interesting compliance yeah, thing, right? People who, lo- who grasp low detail, high detail. Yeah, you know, yeah. That sort of thing. That's right. Well, clients, you know, with lower financial literacy or, you know, where English is a second language. Yeah. Or, you know, yeah. The, that, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, they need more explanation. Yeah, an 80-page document of tick boxes ain't necessarily... Well, <laughs> most <laughs> statements of advice, or we, we review a lot of statements of advice and, and we've, you know, tried to help clients develop better ones. And there's always, you know, people want them templated. Mm. Yeah. Um, and they don't serve their purpose and they would, mm. they don't protect advisors. Yeah. Um, well, no, it's a document in itself. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure you've been in, in the court going there, well, <laughs> but it was in the SOA and the judge is like, yeah, no, a reasonable person would have done that. So yeah. Yeah. is that pretty much what happens? Absolutely. If it doesn't, mm. if it's not in writing, it, it, the, the court will tend to prefer the client's evidence over mm. the evidence of the advisor. I wonder if perhaps we just be mindful that rather like the, the word template shouldn't necessarily be uh, interchangeable with, with scalable. So, you know, mm. I think I think what advisors are building for are scalable businesses, but mm. that kind of, that solution at the moment looks like a template, but maybe we can kind of... Yeah. Yeah. The key thing that we see is that the basis for the advice is not related to the client, Yeah. Um, the client's circumstances. The linkage there, yeah, isn't it? That's yeah. the linkage, yeah. Mm. It's not personalised sufficiently. Um, there'll be a sort of a whole list of reasons why something is, and most of them are kind of... Um, Passive language, mm-hmm. not related to the client, and often certainly not related to the client's goals and objectives. They're just, you know, sort of features. They're mainly features and benefits. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, which yeah. just doesn't cut it. Which, no, not if it's not related to something that mm. the client has said that they value. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Or it doesn't demonstrate how the client will be better off as a result of the advice. Mm. Um, well, often, yeah, you look at, I've, I've seen templates come back and it's listed all the features of the product. I'm like, I, just delete half of them sometimes right. because it's just unnecessary information because the reason yeah. why you're selecting it is just it's got nothing to do with that. That's right. But That's I think right. this is really lovely, especially for younger advisors, because I know that when I was working in an institution and I would receive an SOA from power planning, I was green enough to the point where I didn't understand what needed to be there and what didn't need mm, to be there. So I, I wasn't sure if the complexity was part of the necessity, like if that mm. was a necessity. So all the features and benefits, like I felt a bit more comfortable going to talk to advisors because I was like, well, there's a whole bunch of work that's gone in here. Mm. But it doesn't, that's that's not the compliant way. It, it's really kind of boiled down it to can best confuse the best interest and situation articulating that in clear language. Right? Mm. It doesn't necessarily need to be any more than that. Yeah. Totally. You're absolutely right. Advisors get almost very, very little training and coaching on what's required in a statement of advice and how to express their advice. Uh, mm. It's something that they're somehow miraculously expected to pick up on their own. I'm getting the feeling that it could be like a, a new uh, course or like... A, <laughs> Definitely. It sounds like a... <laughs> well, my understanding, and I don't know whether this is still true, was that there was a period at which um, you couldn't pass that last... Um, what is it, you know, subject in the in the Diploma of Financial Services, which is about creating SOAs, unless yep. it was 70 or 80 pages. Ooh, I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe that was a sneaky, sneaky... Well, actually, uh, yeah, they do set, yeah, yeah, like the actual page requirements sometimes. I don't, I don't know okay. whether they did or they didn't, yeah, but that, well, that was depends. like, well, you know, that's not necessarily... Um, yeah, the length is not... Yeah. No, not at all. Is it speaking to the client's needs? That's, that's the key issue. Yeah. Mm. Well, well, the challenge yeah. is, yeah, getting it succinct. That, that is when, if you can communicate and get the same across in yeah. succinct, succinct language, it's usually the, the way mm. to go. I actually had a question around, have you, have you been dealing with anyone that's been doing video SOA presentations or using different types of media in there? Uh, yes, we have. A couple of clients have been doing that, but um, they're also following it up to... with, yeah, they tend to be following it up with a document. Yeah, so no one doing complete, like, video SOA without, like, no, a document. Okay. No, no, no. I, I don't think we'll see that because everybody needs, a, like, a reference. It's too time-consuming to have to go through a video every single time. Mm, yeah. That's true. Yeah. Uh, before we wrap up, Claire, and, and thank you, you've been awesome with your time, so I really, really appreciate it. Um, but... Uh, I'm kind of keen. I've learned in the lead up to this uh, a bit of a passion project that you're you're working on with your husband. Oh yeah. Well, um, we, my husband and I, um, I guess, feel the collective guilt a bit about indigenous, uh, the state of indigenous uh, people in Australia, and um, we, because we're so passionate about startups, um, we we've. One of the, we, we've established a, a foundation. It's just it's just a small foundation, um, which uh, one of its primary um, focuses is uh, indigenous startup businesses and empowering indigenous people to, uh, you know, to actually um, get 
the support that they need in order to to run businesses. Are you able to share the name, or is it? Um, oh no, no, it's just our it's just our family foundation. Okay, but okay. there's one business that we really love called First Australians Capital. Okay. And uh, so we've we've been quite involved with them. And the other thing, the other aspect that we really love is. Um, the f- we're really concerned about the fact that we're losing uh, the, with every year that goes by we're losing more and more Aboriginal culture and you know mm. we were we were never taught I was never taught to value Aboriginal culture mm. but what I've learned in the last few years through being exposed to projects like um, Home Ground, which is an amazing project run um, out of the Opera House by a woman called Rhoda Roberts, mm. where they are uh, they bring uh, tribes from all around Australia um, to uh, and tribes is probably the wrong word Aboriginal groups um, to do their dances, and it's like a dance off, and it happens <laughs> at Christmas um, in the in the summer break each year, and uh, and what that's doing is encouraging the younger generation in those um, groups to learn the traditional dances and learn the traditional <laughs> songs. And, of course, it's the songs which are the connectors for... Uh, for well, the storytelling. Um, that's people. fair. Yeah. That's the whole thing. That's right. the history. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, you know, if you there's an amazing exhibition down at um, the Australian National Gallery at, at the moment. Uh, not the gallery. Um, the National Gallery of, of Australia, which that's is different. That's the one on British <clears throat> Street? No, 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 no. It's this is in Canberra. Canberra, sorry, yeah, yeah. yeah. Southwest, and it's yeah. about song lines, and and what they've done is they've mapped all the song lines, and then they they're telling the story of of quite a number of the significant song lines. But wow. there are there are areas where and song lines are the way that there's stories and songs that uh, um, Indigenous people tell and sing in order to to tell someone the way from say Geraldton to Sydney, and mm. and it's it's a wonderful fable like that goes on forever, and it's yeah. incredibly funny. Um, and so there's like, and through the song lines, that's how if you go, if you travel from one part of Australia to another, you you learn first of all the you know the physical features of the landscape, and also the languages and how the languages of different areas mm. kind of connect with each other. It's got the most most amount of dialects of any language in the world, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. So anyway, we we just think that that culture is so rich and it's yeah. it's in danger of of uh, lo- we're losing so much of it, and so we just love projects that a restore that and B, um, you know, help Indigenous people to, uh, to to basically make a start in life. And If anyone and out there wants to support this, mm. like is there somewhere that you would direct them or with what you're doing? Uh, no, no, look, ours is just a, our own family foundation. Mm. But, yeah, if they're interested in first in, in, in investing in those sorts of projects yeah. and, and what I love about First Australian Capital is that it's not, uh, it's not welfare, right? They mm. actually, it's done on the basis that the money will be repaid once the business mm. is up and running. So it's a social so. business. Yeah, yeah, social yeah it's enterprise. a social enterprise. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So we, we think that's a fantastic thing. Yeah. And Very the cool. other one is Homegrown which is down uh, part of the Opera House. But absolutely, they take they love donations. <laughs> awesome. Um, mm. And for you and, and the legal b- business, are you kind of open for advisors getting in contact with you about Absolutely. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's yeah. the best way to do that? Uh, yes, well, just um, you can go to our website and yeah. there's a contact form there or obviously, um, you know, send an email to me, Claire W <laughs> at um, thefoldlegal.com.au. Yeah. yeah, so no, we, we welcome... Um, uh, we, we love, as I said, we love working with small to medium enterprises yeah. and uh, advice businesses. And we can help with a whole range of things like shareholders agreements, structuring your business, you know, setting up your commercial arrangements, buying portfolios, selling portfolios, all of that sort of stuff. Plus, of course, this, you know, regulatory regulatory area, mm. hopefully fixing things, helping you fix things before it becomes a problem. But in the unlikely event or yeah. unhappy event that <laughs> you receive one of those nasty notices from ASIC or the FPA, um, yeah, we can help Happy with those help as well. well. And, I, and I can talk firsthand that, you know, Ben and I walked very uh, anxiously up to up William Street into your office and, and we're surprised. It, it doesn't doesn't feel like you're walking. You know you're not walking into a traditional legal office. That's that's a fact. And, well, uh, you, you should come and visit us in O'Connell Street now because oh, okay, we've yeah. actually hit the big time. We've moved <laughs> to the city and we've got a really lovely open plan office in uh, in O'Connell Street now in an old um, Art Deco building. Yeah, and, cool. and, and, and that's been fantastic. I'm yes, sure but, we haven't lost the vibe of William Street. Oh, it's, it's actually much <laughs> better it's, it's even better you'd love it but what look the thing that we really enjoy and I think we're really good at is taking really very complex legislation and a regulatory regime and making it understandable for people and we have you know compliance manuals that do that if people want to sort of self-serve but yeah if if you're confused or or worried about something mm. you know I think one of our great skills is helping people to understand it and sort of navigate that pathway for them for sure mm. awesome thank you Claire really appreciate it 
Thank you. Cool. Cheers.